Hello, everyone. Good Sunday. Good morning. Really good happy morning. to see you. We are doing our spiritual Sunday today, and we're playing around and trying new ways of making sure we're available for our community. So we'll be streaming. We're going to do a hybrid today. We're going to be in person and uh, live. And so we're going to start with a little uh, prayer, and, and then we're going to go back into our traditional scheduling, right? But I just want to let, let, guys, let you know that we are all wearing masks over here. But during the talk, uh, I might remove my mask, but there are no one who is within 10 feet, basically, close to me. Just want to make sure we say that because we do believe uh, that it's important to follow the guidelines. And with that, we're going to call our good friend Tom. Tom, would you mind doing a prayer for us? Good morning, everyone. I'd like to read from this book, Happy Life, and then we'll start with a prayer. Be a friend to all. Friendship is a treasure of the spirit and a mean to be shared, and it is meant to be shared. Like the sun, it shines and bestows joy upon all who receive it. There is a critical shortage of friends on the earth, which breeds con conflict, mistrust, instability, and insecurity. When people lack friendship in their lives, they put themselves in danger. Be a kind friend, even if you are experiencing a misunderstanding and hardship. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here today. Our friends here in this room and our friends out there in the internet and beyond. Help us to understand this message today. Let it sink in and let it uh, enlighten us and bring us closer together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tom. That was lovely. We really appreciate that. Um, we are still figuring out our tech setup here, so we're going to ask for your continued patience with us. Um, and we really appreciate you being here today. So I'm going to remove my mask, but again, I just want to make sure that we know that here we are following all protocols. Um, so friends, it's um, really a big pleasure to be here with you because it is Sunday. And it's been a while since I have been here with you on Sunday. And I am so thrilled that we have a new place that is shaping up to be such a wonderful facility for us. And for our spiritual Sunday, I would really love to have a conversation, informal conversation with you about something which I find very important to our times, the miracle of happiness. And today, I want to talk about happiness, but I don't want to just talk about happiness. I want to go back and revisit the first public miracle that this incredible spirit, Jesus Christ, performed while he was on earth with us. The turning of water into wine at the are wedding we have in Cana. Yes, we are going to have a kids' meeting. Come on in. They're all the way over there, back there. Put your mask on and get in there. I didn't bring that. There's a mask over here for you if you want. There you go. Um, there's, this is exactly what we're hoping for a miracle of happiness. Happiness just walked into the door right now. That's amazing. Um, so we're really thrilled. But why do I say that? I say that because I think we have all been beaten down by this past two years and we have found ourselves in a place of worry, of anxiety, um, sometimes of distrust, sometimes of um, uh, fear, right? Certainly of pain and stress. And in many ways, we have struggled with happiness. And even when we find reasons to be happy sometimes we feel a little guilty about being happy in this day and age because we know that there's so much happening out there today that we worry whether we should be feeling happy whether we should tell people we're happy should we pretend that we're not happy is that the considerate thing to do right so um and so i hope that today we can kind of figure that piece out a tiny little bit by visiting this wonderful first miracle of jesus uh, that we find in the Gospel of John, in the New Testament, and the Christian Bible. And, and I think that's really important because my argument today is that everything starts with joy. Jesus' first miracle was that of happiness. And I think that is important to us. So I submit to your, um, to your uh, analysis that we should also start with happiness. We should start with happiness in our days. We should start with happiness in our lives. We should start with joy everywhere we can. So um, so we want to talk about that a little bit. 
And we want to talk about that miracle, and I promise I won't talk too much. But it's also important for us to talk about what miracles are. Because in a larger sense, we think that miracles are something that is beyond our understanding. It's something magical that happens because God wanted to. And while that can seem like that, the truth is, miracles are nothing else but special events that we don't yet understand, but they're perfectly understandable, and we can strive to know how to perform them too. Because if God is perfect, then there is no flaw out there in the universe, and there's no need to create some special hocus-pocus, some special intervention to fix something, because the system works beautifully. So when we talk about miracles, we talk about some sort of knowledge of manipulation of the building blocks of the universe that we don't quite know how it is, but it's perfectly understandable to those who are far ahead in our evolutionary track, such as our older brother in incredible model, Jesus Christ. Um, so, so that's what we mean by miracles. And, and in the New Testament, which is uh, the second half of the Christian Bible, we find about 34 different miracles. 33 if you take out the resurrection, but I think it's a pretty good miracle, so I'm going to go with 34. Um, and all those miracles have different stories, and they're beautiful. And I think they have wonderful lessons to us about our daily lives. We have healing of people. We have feeding of people. Um, we have casting out of demons. We have all kinds of um, things like bringing people back to life. But the first miracle is the miracle of the wedding at Cana, of turning water into wine. And I think it's a miracle of joy. So that's why we that's why we want to start. So we start with happiness. So with your um, with your uh, permission, I am actually going to read the description of this miracle that we find in John 2. So the second chapter of the Gospel of John, which is the only place that this miracle shows up. And it's right at the beginning of John. Right in the beginning of John, you know, the word comes to, to fruition. In chapter 2, we talk about this miracle. So it's the earliest miracle that we have notice of. And it's just 11 sentences, of just 11 verses. So I'm going to ask for your indulgence. I'm going to read it and we can analyze it together briefly. Okay? Um, and I'm really excited because I was able to pull out here uh, one of the many Bibles that we now have in our group. And if you wanted to check them out, they were over there in the library today. I'm going to be reading the 11 out of the New Jerusalem Bible, which is my best version, well, my favorite version, I should say, uh, because of the scholars that came together to kind of figure out what was there. And so let's do this. The wedding at Cana. So chapter 2 of the Gospel of John. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. And they ran out of wine, since the wine provided for the feast had all been used. And the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said, Woman, what do you want from me? And by the way, woman, it's not a derogatory term. In the translation, like in the language, was just like a, basically was not saying woman. He was just saying, hey, mother, right? It's just a translation thing. Um, Woman, what do you want from me? My hour has not come yet. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. There were six stone water jars standing there, meant for ablutions that are customary among the Jews. Each could hold 20 or 30 gallons. That's a lot. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the, waters, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the president of the feast. The president of the feast is the main waiter, like the guy that's actually overseeing the whole feast. They did this. The president tasted the water and he had turned into wine. Having no idea where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the president of the feast called the, bride, the, the bridegroom and said, Everyone serves good wine first. And then worse wine when the guests are well wined. But you have kept the best wine till now. This was the first of Jesus' signs. He was a canna in Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went on. Right? So, so why do I say that? Because 
I think there are important things for us to kind of talk about the story. I think we want to make sure first we understand what the story is, and I think then, then we can start to unwrap it a little bit, right? So what's the story? The story is that there is a wedding at a town or a city called Canuck, which nobody actually knows where it literally was. There are some arguments about where exactly Canuck was. There are different spots that the historians can't agree, but we know it's in Galilee, right? Um, and I think what's really interesting here too is that we see Mary, Jesus' mother, attending this wedding, and the disciples, we're told, were also invited. So I think, even though we don't know here, I take it to mean that this was someone maybe partially related to them, right? Because you just don't invite everybody to your wedding. It's a very happy moment. You know, you invite many people in a town, in a city, but you have to know them to invite them. So that's an interesting piece. There is some, more, some sort of familiarity, I feel like. But this is my conjecture. I want to be clear with you, right? Because we can't tell this from the text. But the disciples are also there, which means, which is interesting because they might also be be known to those people. So it, it might be from somebody that they knew, right? Um, and I think that's a really interesting story. And so what happens? They are there, and they must have been having a good time. And not a rowdy time. There was probably not drunk people falling over, right? Because they were enjoying it to such a point that Mary said, oh, they are running out of wine. I mean, if you, you only get worried about running out of wine if everything else is going well. Because if the party is getting a little bit too much, you're actually glad that you're running out of wine, right? Can we agree that? I think we've all been there, right? So clearly the atmosphere is a great one. They are enjoying yourselves. And why is it that we're running out of wine? We're not quite sure. I think that you can run out of wine because you didn't buy enough because maybe you didn't have enough money, or maybe more guests showed up, right? It could be that one of the lessons we have here is that there's more people that were accepted into that party, and that's why they're running out of wine. But Mary then asks uh, Jesus to do something about it, and he says, but what do I have to do about it? This is not with me, it's not my time. I'm, I'm not supposed to be doing these miracles just yet, right? But what does, he, what does she do? She tells the servants, to do whatever he says. So she's basically pushing him. And she's saying, no, you're going to do something, right? You guys do what he does. So Mary already obviously knows how, how special Jesus is. This, this might have been Jesus' first public miracle. But I'm pretty sure that she has already seen him do some wonderful things that we don't know about. Because that's the only reason she would say, he's going to solve this problem. You, you guys, you guys do what he tells you to. And what do the, do the waiters do? Um, he, Jesus tells them to get six stone jars full of water, right? Or six stone jars that they used to do a ceremonial cleansing, which was a tradition in the Jewish faith. Sometimes you would either immerse yourself in water or clean your hands with this water in many different ways. So it was a way for cleansing, right? But instead of, of, of cleansing themselves, he tells them to fill those six jars, which are really big, 20 to 30 gallons, think about it. That's more than your car tank, right? Your gas of, of the tank in your car. Most cars are about 15 gallons, so two car tanks times six. It's a lot. It's a good amount. He tells them to fill it, and they fill it all the way to the brim, right? And then he tells them to get a little bit and take it to the main waiter to try it out. And the main waiter tries it out, and he doesn't know. He doesn't know. He doesn't know anything that's happening. He doesn't know where the wine has come from, but he tries it. He says, "Ooh, this is good." This is good wine. And he tells the bridegroom, who's obviously organizing the feast and paying for the feast, right? Because it's his wedding. He says, wow, this is wonderful. Generally, people serve the best wine first when people can still tell what they are drinking. Because after they get a little bit happy, it doesn't matter the quality anymore. But you have done the opposite. You actually have the second best wine uh, instead of it putting up first. Um, and that, that's our story. And we take it here that the story goes on and the wedding goes on for, for sure. And they probably had a lovely time because to begin with, they must have had a lovely time for Jesus to continue to provide for that, for the wedding, right? So why do we say that? I say that because I think that there are many symbols that we should pay attention to in this, in this miracle that might speak to our lives. And I think the first one is that it was a wedding. It wasn't a business event. It wasn't a meeting at the temple. It, and I think the symbolism of the wedding is 
It was a, a moment of joy, of coming together, of covenant between people. And I think that is a really beautiful place to start with celebrations. It's celebrating being together like we are here, being with your people, whatever it is. Whatever, whenever it is that you are with the people you love, you should enjoy that. It should be a moment of celebration. And I think the wedding reminds us of that piece. And because I don't have all day, I'm going to speed it up. Because there are so many wonderful things in this story. But I think that the interesting piece also is that we talked about familiarity, is that Mary and the disciples had been invited. So we, we surmise that they already knew those people, which must have just contributed to a wonderful atmosphere. I think we all have been there, right? When we are at a party or we are with a group of people that we really care about and we're happy for them. It is a momentous experience. It's just a really lovely place. And we talked briefly about running out of wine as well, another symbolism, right? Um, why is it that they didn't run out of wine? Did they not plan? Or did they maybe open their hearts to include more people in the party and then the wine just went? But they weren't out of running out of wine in a rapturous manner, right? They weren't like throwing a bender and everybody was in. People were just enjoying themselves and they just didn't have enough. And the party was probably going to end up after a while because they didn't have wine. And if you don't have wine, if you don't have anything else to serve with time, what happens? The party dies down. So it wasn't just about providing alcoholic beverages. If this is what we're taking away from this, we've got it wrong. It is about keeping the party going. That's the miracle of happiness, right? And in that sense, we also are very interested by what happens because Mary asked Jesus, they are running out of wine. She basically asked him to do something about it. She doesn't know what is to be done, but she knows that something can be done. And he asks, she asks him and he says, not my time. This is not my place. But she insists. Let's be clear. She insists and makes it happen. It is because she insisted that this happens. And in many different ways, I think one of the beautiful lessons that we have here is that all of this is happening without the bride and the groom knowing about this. And so if I place us in the story, I don't place us here. We are the bride and the groom. We are the ones having our party. But there are other people that we may not even be aware who are diligently working for our happiness and our well-being. And it could be incarnate friends, but we also know through our studies, it could be our familial spirits. It could be our benefactors, our mentors and guides who are diligently working for our spiritual welfare, even when we don't know it. And that is a beautiful and touching message, in my opinion, because it reminds us of their love for us. Only when you care about somebody, you go to this great lens of insisting that they continue to have what they need to be happy. And so symbolically, we can say that a familiar spirit is asking the higher spirit. So Mary is asking Jesus to provide. And how does Jesus provide? Does he simply open up and say, all right, wine for everybody? Because he could have. If he is able to transform water into wine, he could very well have just made wine appear. He could have moved the water and have it appear. But he doesn't do that. What does he do? He asks the, waiter, the waiters to bring water into the jars. So even when we are being granted grace and love from the spiritual realm, there is still a request that we do something so that it can be augmented by the mentors and guides. Because if we are not working towards it, if we are not adding our own peace, then we're not learning. If we are just pushing it all to our mentors and say, you guys figure it out, figure my problems out, then when is it that we learn? But by the fact that Jesus recruited the servants who were there to serve, and it could be us because we too are servants of happiness of ourselves and others, to make sure that we had the basic that could be augmented by spirituality to do this. And we're going to see Jesus do this often in his miracles. Bring the fishes, bring the loaves, and then he multiplies them. 
as if to say, we have to do something. We have to bring the initial spark. We have to bring the initial resource. We have to bring the initial will that leads us to a better place. And then the mercy of God will come in and will augment, will increase, will enhance those efforts. And I think another beautiful symbolism here too is that the wine came from those jars. And those jars were using for cleansing traditionally within the Jewish tradition. And how did the cleansing take place? Well, simply, you either wash your hands or you immerse yourself in them. But the cleansing took place externally. Whereas the wine, where does it go? Internally. And so the miracle of joy, the kindness of spirituality, it's something that goes beyond the external. It is meant to be taken in, symbolically speaking. That's my take from it, at least. That the truly and beautiful transformative power of it all is when we take it into ourselves and feed our emotions and not do outward acts of cleansing ourselves or dressing well, because we know those are temporary things. And in fact, if we think about it, it also speaks to the quality of the second wine. Because, as we heard eloquently put by our characters here in this, in this play, most people would serve the best wine forward first and keep the less than great wine because after you've drunk a couple, you probably can't tell anymore because you're already under the influence, right? So that's a strategy that generally is not uncommon to be had there. And 2,000 years ago, they were also doing the same thing. So it's been there for a while. But the beautiful thing is that the second wine tastes better and you could tell even if you had been drinking already. And I wonder if there isn't a symbolism there too, that the second nourishment, this internal piece, tastes better than that which we are accustomed to in our day-to-day -day lives. So let me rephrase that. I wonder if there's not a message in here that says that when the nourishment is for the soul and not for the body, it ultimately tastes better. It fulfills us. It carries us over the challenges we have. So it is a subtle message saying, yes, it's important to take care of the body and feed the body, but it is more important and it will satiate us. We will feel happier when we take that in and we nourish our souls. And I think it has everything to do with the teachings of the Christ who has come to be with us, to point us to the reality that we are immortal beings and should focus first on what is spiritual and by consequence figure it out what is material and how to work that piece out. So it is a beautiful, beautiful symbolism that we can unpack in many different ways. But I think one of my favorites here really is the fact that neither the president of the feast, which was the main waiter, the maitre d', right? Or the bridegroom or the bride or the people who were at the party actually were aware of the miracle that was performed for them in that way. Because the people who knew were Mary, the disciples, and the servants. But the rest of it, it was unseen. And I wonder if there isn't a lot of that in our lives too. When the good mentors, the good spiritual helpers perform so many miracles for us, that is to say, move so many stones for us so that we can go about our day and we don't even realize because we're not paying attention. Or sometimes how many of us are here, our parents, like our kids don't know the effort we go through to provide for them. And why would it be different from the spiritual realm? We don't know sometimes the effort they make to provide us. But you may say, Dan, that is very nice and symbolic. And But what does that really have to do with happiness at the end of the day? Well, I think that we can just make a quick stop here, do a parenthesis, if you will, and talk about why happiness matters. We can take a, a little bit of a sidestep to science, and we know that through our research, we know that when we are stressed, for instance, and I think we can all agree that this past two years have been very demanding and stressful, right? We know and we have done research that the long-lasting or 
the long exposure or uh, exposure or use of cortisol, which is the hormone that we produce when we are stressed, can be detrimental to us. Cortisol is an important piece for our bodies in terms of an evolutionary process. This is the hormone that we release in our body when we are in a moment of tension, when we are in a moment of difficulty, because cortisol does different things. One of them is it enhances our use of glucose or energy or sugar in our brains. And it also basically shuts down anything else that is not important for that crisis that we have. So let me give you an example. If you were walking down a forest and you're happy and you saw a tiger all of a sudden six feet away from you, you would go, uh oh, hopefully, right? Because it's not Tiger Woods, it's a tiger. And you're looking at tiger, not Tiger Woods. And you're like, oh, a tiger is a dangerous animal. It could eat me. So your body, your mind, your system will generate cortisol. You will start thinking about what is it that I need to do? You'll get some extra energy because you have to figure it out whether you're gonna fight or you're gonna run away. And in that moment, anything else that is not important to that survival gets sidetracked. So you have tunnel vision. You will no longer notice at the moment how beautiful the forest is. You will no longer notice how the weather is wonderful. You are going to notice what? There is a tiger in front of me and I'm in danger, right? So you get the tunnel vision, you stop to see everything else and what do you focus on? The problem. So that's what happens when we have large amounts of cortisol injected into our system all of a sudden. It shuts down our ability to perceive everything else but the problem. That's why mindful is so helpful. That's why it's growing because people are realizing that during stress, we shut down when we focus on what? on our problems and we can't seem to get out of our problems because we have evolutionary, physically speaking, been trained to have this mechanism to help us survive. But now we have to detrain it to make sure that we can survive because we're no longer being exposed to tigers, right? We need to survive emotionally. And so we have to retrain ourselves to figure that piece out, which means we want to go back to that place where we can see the details and the options and not just be tracking the problem. So for this past two years, we have been so focused on the tensions, anxieties, and problems that sometimes we forget to make space for ourselves to be in joy so that we can see the bigger picture. So we can see the miracles that are done and performed for us every single day. The miracle of happiness. The miracle of being together. The miracle of enjoying each other's company. And I think that is why I love this parable of the wedding at Cana so much of turning the water into wine. Because it reminds us that we have to find joy and happiness in the things we know. It doesn't come from new things that we haven't explored, that too. But we can find joy in everything, things like being with those that we care about, doing the things that we have. And I wonder I wonder if there isn't a way for us to start putting that into our lives and saying joy should be the first thing we do when we wake up. Joy should be the first thing we seek when we are in trouble. Jo joy should be what we aim to do when we are with other people. We need to prioritize joy. And I think the second thing is to remind ourselves that there are many people working for our happiness. And that includes our spiritual guides, the benefactors, which we now know to be there because as we have studied spiritism, we have realized that we have lived lives before this one and we have had many family members and people who care about us from those previous lives that might not be incarnate with us right now, but that doesn't mean that they don't love us or care for us, much the same way that if you have lost a loved one in this lifetime, you have not stopped loving them. The bond of love continues. And if you were the one who had passed out, passed to the other side, would you continue not to care for and love your children, those that you care for? Would you not continue to intercede like Mary did to Jesus and say, hey, please help those that I want to love? And so it's important for us to realize that we are not alone, which is a wonderful reminder in these times of stress, in these times of anxiety, we 
are not alone. We are at a wedding banquet, but we have to realize that. And I think the third takeaway is that the second one is better than the first, which means the happiness that will come from paying attention to things that come from the Spirit, they will taste better for us. They will last longer. So let us not get confused about where we should really spend time seeking happiness. It's okay to enjoy our life in the physical world. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying let's avoid everything that's material. But let's focus first, which is a message that Jesus repeated constantly in his teachings. Let's focus first on what's spiritual. Let's make sure our treasure is in growing and learning and being with others and developing emotionally and becoming a better human being because that will bring us lasting happiness. Physical happiness is a good thing. Getting a new car, a new house, getting things feels good and that's okay. But don't get trapped in thinking that is the only thing that will make you happy because that will get you trapped in a cycle of I need more of this. And then when that goes away, you need more of that. And you can constantly chase something that will never satiate, a water that you can never really be fulfilled by. But when you do something wonderful in spirit, then it fuels your heart, fuels you with joy. And being with other people, enjoying each other's company is certainly one of those. And so, in this day and age, when there's so much anxiety, there's so much pain and suffering. Let us be the ones that follow this wonderful lesson and perform this first miracle in our days too. When we wake up, let us try to find a way to be joyful. When we are with others, let's try to find a way to be happy. Let's focus on the things that we have rather than the things that we don't have because that will expand our perception, science tells us, and make sure that we're not limited to only see what is bad and hard out there. And if we do that, if we inject a little bit of happiness every day in our lives, I wonder what miracles will follow. Because this was the first miracle. It was the miracle that in a way started all of them. But the miracles that follow, that Jesus performed while he was with us, were even more powerful in a way and very beautiful too. He healed those who were hurt. He fed those who didn't have what to eat. He brought people back to life. And I think that to me, he helped us refocus on what really matters because we know there is no death anymore in spiritism. We are shown that every day when we talk to the spirits in our mediumistic meetings or when we read books that were psychographed or written by the spirits. So the beginning of it is joy and I hope that we too can remind ourselves of this during our days and ask ourselves, what am I doing today that brings joy into my life? Because I guarantee you, if you do that long enough, the world will become a better place. Whether the world changes or not, we will find it to be a better place. So on this Sunday, when we're thinking about different things and glad to be together, I celebrate all of you and feel joy to be with you thinking about great things and enjoying the fact that we're here, our kids are also there. What else can we ask for? Really, it's a good day. So we hope that we will continue to make that a good day and leave these messages of Jesus with us to think about. The miracle of joy, that's where it starts. So we thank those who might be watching. We are going to interrupt our broadcast now as we continue our activities here in the center. Thanks for watching. We hope you come back soon.